Welcome back to the deep dive. Today we are jumping into Oklo Inc. Uh, the ticker is OKLO. Right, and this one's really interesting. A pre-revenue nuclear startup, MIT founders, you know, promising to shake up the energy sector. Exactly, especially now with AI just demanding, well, seemingly endless amounts of power. And that brings us to the big question for you, the listener. It's pretty stark. AI needs a ton of energy, maybe an insatiable amount. Can Oklo actually deliver on its promises? Or is that current stock price around $136? Is that already pricing in success that might just be, well, unrealistic, a, a prelude to a meltdown, perhaps? That's exactly what we're here to figure out. We've put together a, a really comprehensive seven-chapter analysis of Okilo. It's anchored to today, October 27, 2025. Our goal is to really weigh the bullish story against some very real risks, execution, regulation, the works. Okay, let's unpack this. So we're splitting this into two parts for you. Part one, we'll lay the groundwork, we'll cover the core business model, look at the management team, there's a bit of a paradox there, and check out their financial runway. Got it, and then part two? Then in part two, we'll look outwards. Market sentiment, who owns this stock, the big risk factors, and finally, we'll bring it all together with a valuation conclusion. All right, let's dive straight in. The core business. Chapter one, business understanding. Okay, so Oklo's strategy. It's meant to be disruptive. They call it energy as a service or ease. Ease, ease is. So they're not just like selling reactor designs. No, not at all. They're aiming for vertical integration, build, own, and operate. They sell the power directly themselves using long-term contracts, power purchase agreements, PPAs. Huh, that sounds ambitious. More like an infrastructure play than just a tech company. High risk, maybe. Definitely high risk, high reward. The idea is they capture the entire value chain. If and it's a big if if they execute perfectly, analysts think they could eventually hit uh, long-term EBITDA margins over sixty percent, free cash flow margins over fifty percent. Wow. Okay, sixty percent. That's that's huge compared to traditional utilities. Unheard of, really. So, what's the tech? What's actually generating the power in this model? Right. The heart of it is the Aurora powerhouse. Think compact. Mm -hmm. It's a liquid metal-cooled fast neutron reactor, generates up to seventy-five megawatts electric. Okay, seventy-five megawatt compact. But what's the key difference? Why this design? Well, it's not just size, it's the physics and engineering. It uses simplified architecture, and crucially, it operates at ambient pressure. No high pressure involved. No high pressure. Why is that such a big deal for, you know, the bottom line and for safety? It fundamentally changes things. Traditional reactors need these massive, super thick containment structures because of the high pressure. Non-pressurized, you avoid a lot of that complexity and cost. It's inherently safer, potentially cheaper, and theoretically much faster to build. Okay, that makes sense. Faster, cheaper, safer. Sounds good. And Aurora is designed for 247 baseload power. We're talking capacity factors potentially over 90%. And get this, refueling only maybe once a decade, maybe even longer. Once a decade. Wow. That uptime is critical. And you mentioned they're also tackling the waste issue. Yes, exactly. That's another angle. They have two complementary business lines they're planning. First, nuclear fuel recycling. Basically, taking used fuel waste and turning it back into fuel for their Aurora reactors. A circular economy for nuclear fuel. That's, yeah. that's a huge deal if they can pull it off. Tackles a massive political problem. Potentially, yes. Yeah. And second, they plan to sell radioisotopes. These are byproducts from the reactor used in medicine, industry. Another revenue stream. Okay, so big vision. But where are they now? Still pre-revenue, right? Correct. Zero revenue currently. They're targeting their first commercial deployment for 2027, but they do have some early signs of traction. Like what? They've signed 20-year letters of intent. Pretty significant ones, too, with Diamondback Energy out in the Permian Basin and also Wyoming Hyperscale for a data center project. Data centers and oil fields, mm -hmm. right where the power demand is exploding. Smart positioning. It puts them right in the path of that AI and electrification wave. Yeah. But it's not easy. They're fighting on two fronts. Well, first, technology. They're up against other small modular reactor developers. Think New Scale, Rolls-Royce, SMR. Who gets to market first? Whose tech is better? Second, economics. They have to compete with established utilities like Vistra, Exelon for those long-term power contracts. And hovering over all of this is the regulator, the NRC. We have to talk about their track record there. Yeah, this is critical. Oklo's first shot at a combined license. Their application was denied by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission back in January 2022. Denied. That's a, that's a major setback. A big red flag for investors, surely. It absolutely is. It shows how tough this process is and the cost of getting it wrong. Mm. But there's a potential positive on the horizon. Yeah. A new regulatory framework called 10 CFR Part 53. 
Part 53. Okay, break that down. Why could that be a game changer for them? Well, the old rules, part 50 and 52, were really written for the gigantic traditional light water reactors. Very prescriptive. Part 53 aims to be more modern, uh, risk-informed, and technology-inclusive. Meaning, in simple terms, the NRC would focus more on the actual safety performance and risk profile of a specific advanced design, like Aurora, rather than just checking boxes based on old assumptions. It should make licensing more efficient for these novel reactors. Should being the operative word. Exactly. It's expected maybe around 2027, but it's not finalized. And even then, Oklo still has to successfully navigate it. Until they have that license in hand, regulatory risk remains the biggest shadow over the company. Okay, that risk profile naturally leads us to who's steering the ship through these choppy waters. Let's talk management. Chapter 2, Management Evaluation. So the leadership team looks pretty solid on paper. It's founder-led. Jacob and Caroline Duvet, both MIT grads, they've built a team around them with serious experience. The CFO is a BP veteran. The chief product officer is an NRC veteran. That mix of technical founders and industry regulatory veterans seems like the right recipe. You'd think so. It seems essential for this kind of venture. Yeah. But then we hit this paradox when we look at what they're actually doing with their stock. Right. On one hand, high insider ownership, that's usually good. What is it? 20, 28% signals alignment. Skin in the game. Exactly. That's the positive signal. Hmm. But the negative signal, and this is a big one you need to focus on, is the pattern of insider selling. How significant are we talking? We're talking very significant. Over the last 12 months, insiders have sold something like 19 million shares and purchases. Only about 11,000 shares. 19 million sold versus 11,000 bought. Wow. That includes the founders. CFO. Uh, yes, yeah, co-founders, CFO, other key insiders. Now look, some selling post IPO for diversification. That's totally normal, expected even. But the sheer volume here is what raises eyebrows. It's substantial and consistent. So what's the interpretation? Why should we care if they're cashing out a bit? The stock's run up, hasn't it? We should care because these are the people who know the company, the technology, the regulatory hurdles better than anyone. When they sell large amounts of stock at current prices, it can signal that they might believe the stock is fully valued or maybe even overvalued. Hmm. So it's like, they're saying one thing with the company's vision, but maybe signaling something else with their wallets. It creates a real tension, yeah. It's a major red flag that acts as a headwind against that purely bullish story. You have to ask why they aren't holding on for the potential massive upside they're pitching if they truly believe it's just around the corner. A definite paradox to keep in mind. What about how they're spending the company's money? Capital allocation. Right now, it's all focused on the core mission, R&D, pushing through the licensing process, getting ready for potential construction. You see that in the accelerating operating expenses. Any big strategic moves? Acquisitions. There was an intent announced late last year, in 2024, to acquire a company called Atomic Alchemy Inc. for about $25 million. Seems aimed at strengthening their vertical integration, especially on the fuel side, but mostly it's about funding the core development. Okay, that focus costs money. Let's look at the numbers. Chapter three, financial analysis. First thing, context is everything here. The market cap is hovering around $20.08 billion. Let's just let that sink in. $20 billion for a company with zero revenue. Zero. So the market is pricing in just enormous future success already. Perfect execution, basically. Very perfect, yeah. yeah. Years in advance. Now, the income statement, as you'd expect, reflects this pre-revenue stage. All the profit margins are negative. Operating losses actually widened in fiscal 2024 to about negative $52.8 million. And free cash flow. Got to be negative, too. Increasingly negative. Trailing 12 months, it's around minus $53.5 million. That's just the reality of heavy R&D, licensing costs, pre-construction work in this capital-intensive industry. Okay, so burning cash, high valuation. Now, yeah. what about their ability to keep burning cash? What's the runway look like? Financial strength. Ah, uh, now this is the flip side, and it's a major positive. Thanks to that SPAC merger that brought them public, their balance sheet is exceptionally strong right now. How strong? Debt. Zero long-term debt. Debt to equity ratio is effectively 0.00, <laughs> and they have a lot of liquidity. Good numbers. About $534 million in cash and short-term investments on the books. And look at the current ratio, it's something like 71.27. 71. That's huge. So basically, they have plenty of cash to fund operations for quite a while without needing to raise more immediately. Exactly. That strong cash position and lack of debt gives them a substantial operational runway. It insulates them 
for now, from needing to tap external financing in potentially unfavorable market conditions. Mm -hmm. That's crucial given the regulatory uncertainty and the long timelines involved. They can weather some delays. All right, so strong balance sheet, big vision, but also big risks, and that insider selling paradox. How is the wider market digesting all this? Chapter four, market sentiment. It's uh, mm -hmm. polarized, to say the least. On the surface, you see a consensus buy rating from the 13 or so analysts covering it, mm -hmm. but big defer. And the price targets are all over the map. I mean, wildly dispersed. The low target is down around $14. The high is way up at $175. The average is somewhere in the 96 to 101 range. $14 to $175. That's not just disagreement. That's a fundamental chasm in how experts are trying to value this thing. Precisely. It screams valuation uncertainty. This kind of disruptive pre-revenue tech, especially in nuclear, it just doesn't fit neatly into traditional models. How do you discount cash flows that are years away and dependent on so many variables, including regulatory approval? And the bears aren't just talking. They're putting money behind their view, right? right? Short interest. Oh, yeah. It's significant. Currently sitting at 14.13% of the public float. 14%. That's high. What does that tell us? It tells us there's strong conviction among a notable group of investors that the current stock price at $136, is just too high and unsustainable given the risks. They are actively betting against it. But high short interest can also be rocket fuel, potentially. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It creates that classic short squeeze potential. If Oklo gets some undeniably good news, like a positive NRC ruling, maybe faster than expected, those shorts might scramble to cover their positions, driving the price up very quickly. It adds another layer of volatility. And the news flow, the media narrative, it reflects this fight. Completely. It's a total battleground stock. Mm. Bulls point to the AI energy crunch, the big potential partnerships like that $2 billion collaboration mentioned with Nucleo. Well, bears hammer the valuation, the execution risks, and they point to big names trimming their stakes. Like Kathy Wood's ARK Invest, right? They've sold some. That's right. ARK has trimmed its position, which gets a lot of attention. So you have this constant tug of war in the headlines and investor commentary. What about the charts? Any technical signals? It's a big picture there, too. Mm -hmm. The stock price, $136.05, is currently below its 50-day moving average. Yeah. That's generally seen as a bearish short-term signal. Huh. But it's still way above its 200-day moving average, which is down around $59.54. That suggests the strong, longer-term bullish trend that drove the stock up is, technically speaking, still intact despite the recent pullback. Interesting mix of signals. Let's look at who actually holds the shares. Who are the key players here? Chapter 5, Ownership Structure. Okay, so institutional ownership is pretty solid. It's somewhere in the 33% to 38% range. You've got the big players in there, BlackRock, Vanguard. Standard stuff for a company of this size now. And it's in those thematic ETFs too, right? Like the uranium ones. Yep. It's become a core holding in ETFs like the Global X Uranium ETF URA. So it gets bought and sold based on flows into those kinds of funds as well. But what about concentration? Is ownership spread out or is it tight? It's actually quite concentrated. The top seven shareholders control a majority of the company. A majority. Okay, that's significant. Yeah. What does that concentration mean in practice? It means these large holders, big institutions, and those insiders we talked about earlier have significant influence over the company and the stock price. And that connects back to the insider selling we discussed in Chapter 2. Exactly. It highlights that tension again. If a few of these major holders decide to sell, even for portfolio rebalancing reasons, it can have a much bigger impact on the stock price than if ownership were more widely dispersed. Their actions carry a lot of weight. Okay. Concentration, high valuation, insider selling. It all points towards needing a very clear-eyed view of the potential downsides. Let's dedicate a chapter just to that. Chapter 6, Risk Assessment. Absolutely crucial. Let's start with the big external threats. Number one, without a doubt, is regulatory risk. Getting that final NRC license approval is everything. It's binary. Without it, the company has no commercial path forward with Aurora. And even if they get the license, then comes execution risk. Right. The nuclear industry has a terrible history of massive construction cost overruns and delays. Oklo must avoid those pitfalls. Their whole economic model depends on building these reactors relatively quickly and affordably. Any major slip-ups there could be fatal. Answered. Competitive risk. They're not the only ones developing small modular reactors. Companies like Nuscale, Rolls-Royce, TerraPower... If a competitor gets their design licensed and deployed significantly faster or cheaper, Oklo could lose that first mover advantage they're aiming for. Those are the company-specific risks. What about broader economic factors? They have cash now, but the model is incredibly capital-intensive long-term. That's a really important point. 
Even with that strong balance sheet today, the future build-out of a whole fleet of reactors will require billions. And that makes them highly sensitive to the macro environment. Like inflation. Definitely. Inflation could dramatically increase the cost of materials, steel, concrete, specialized components, and skilled labor. If construction costs balloon beyond projections, it eats directly into those attractive projected margins. That interest rates. They don't have debt now, but they will likely need it later. Precisely. That future fleet won't be financed just with cash on hand. They'll likely need debt or more equity raises, which dilute existing shareholders. Persistently high interest rates significantly increase the cost of borrowing that capital. That higher cost of capital directly squeezes the profitability of each project. So those fantastic 50% plus free cash flow margins they project could short considerably if rates stay high. They absolutely could. And one more, geopolitical risk. Even for domestic reactors. Yes, because the supply chain for specialized nuclear components is global and complex. Think about new tariffs, export controls, or disruptions. If the U.S. were to impose new tariffs on, say, specific alloys or electronic components needed for Aurora, that could unexpectedly increase the capital expenditure per unit. Making their power potentially less competitive against alternatives. Exactly. It could slow down adoption or force them to accept lower returns. Okay, we've covered the business, the management, the financials, market view, ownership, and the many, many risks. Time to bring it all together. Chapter 7, Conclusion. Let's synthesize the bull case first. What are the arguments for Oklo? You've got potential technology leadership with Aurora, perfectly positioned, it seems, for this huge wave of AI-driven energy demand. You have that unique, potentially very high-margin energies-as-a-service model. And underpinning it all currently is that debt-free balance sheet and strong cash one way. A compelling story on the surface. Now the bear case. Equally potent, I'd say. First and foremost, the staggering $20 billion valuation for a company with zero revenue. Then there's the massive regulatory and execution gauntlet they must run successfully. Remember that initial NRC denial, it hangs heavy. And compounded by. Compounded by that heavy insider selling pattern we discussed. And the significant 14.13% short interest betting against the stock. So what does this all mean when you try to put a number on it? Okay, so... Running an educational discounted cash flow analysis, trying to model out plausible scenarios. Mm -hmm. It's tough, given the uncertainties, but the analysis suggests an intrinsic value range somewhere between $45 and $110 per share. 45 to 110. And the current price is? Around $136.05. So significantly above even the high end of that DCF range. Correct. The current share price is trading at a notable premium. What that tells us is the market appears to be pricing in an extremely optimistic, almost best case scenario already. A scenario where regulatory approval is smooth, construction is on time and budget, and adoption is rapid. Meaning there's no margin of safety baked in for things going wrong. Very little, if any, at this price. For investors who look for a margin of safety to protect against those very real, very substantial regulatory and execution risks inherent in any nuclear venture, let alone a novel one, yeah. That margin just doesn't seem to be present at the current $136 valuation. The market is assuming success, not adequately pricing the potential for failure or significant delays. A very stark conclusion based on that analysis. Mm. But let's end on a provocative thought, maybe looking even further out. It ties back to that fuel recycling idea. Okay. Oklo's tech, if it works as envisioned, is designed to take nuclear waste, which is this huge decades-old political and environmental headache, and turn it into a valuable asset, an energy source. So the question is, could the success of that circular fuel cycle, if they demonstrate it, be the ultimate catalyst? Could it be so powerful that it overrides some of these other risks in the long run? Or will the sheer historical difficulty and political baggage of dealing with nuclear waste remain their biggest barrier, regardless of the tech? That is the multi-billion dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> and really, only successful real-world demonstration over time can answer that. Indeed. Well, we hope this deep dive gave you a lot to think about regarding Oklo. If you found it useful, please like and subscribe to Stock Analytics AI. Yeah, and remember, for just $4.99 a month, you get access to our whole library. That's 500 deep dive videos covering all the S&P 500 stocks. Plus, coming out next, exclusively for members, we're tackling the NASDAQ 100. And members, don't forget you can request deep dives too. Just drop the stock ticker in the comments section on our platform and we'll get working on it for you. And the usual reminder, this analysis was generated by an AI system. It's for educational purposes only. It is absolutely not financial advice. Please always do your own thorough research or consult with a qualified financial advisor before making any investment decisions.